So, my name is Matthias Clayson. I work in the desktop team at Red Hat. I'm actually a manager there, so all you hear today is just hearsay from my perspective. The people who do the actual work work for me. And in particular, if you're really interested in in depth technical updates on Wayland, I highly recommend looking at um, the summary that appeared in LWM last week of uh, Jasper Sumchair's update that he gave last week in Quartic, where he talked about his work on, on Wayland porting of GNOME, and there was really a lot of good information there. So you should really read that if you want to get in depth information. I'll just stick to the more high level overview here today. But um, let's see how far we get. Um, so my topic was, where's Wayland? And uh, one answer is, obviously, <laughs> it's close to where I live. Uh, so I, you can see it down here, that's Wayland. Austin is off to the, to the east, and I actually live a little up there. You can see Acton, that's where I live. And if you go a little further up, you get to Westford, where the Red Hat office, the Boston office, so, so as we call it, is located. And if you look around here, a little uh, to the east of Wayland, you can also see Weston, which is another well-known name in this space. So that's um, one answer to the, to the question in my, in my topic. And we can almost leave it at that. But of course, um, Wayland is also in Fedora 21. So you can, if you're, if you're running Fedora 21 or uh, Rawhide even, you can just, uh, on the login screen, select a Wayland session and try things that way. And it even kind of works. I've, I've, I do that every now and then. I don't run it every day. But um, whenever I try it, I, I can get things done. And every week, a, little, uh, a few more things start working, so uh, progress is being made. And you can follow along if you want to try it out. Um, but um, maybe it's actually uh, worthwhile stepping back a little bit and uh, talk about what Valen actually is. And uh, I'll spend the first half of my talk so giving a little overview of, about over the Wayland ecosystem and, and why we would be interested in doing that kind of thing. So um, on a uh, basic level, Wayland is really just a protocol definition. It's like a specification of a client-server protocol, and the protocol defines whether that application is a Wayland compositor, if it speaks the server side of that protocol, or whether it's a client if it speaks, speaks the client side of that protocol. Um, and the communication between the two sides uh, works over a socket, so that is all very much as you would expect it, and as you also know it from X, so there's not much different here yet. Um, and clients obviously normally don't implement the protocol manually themselves. Um, they use toolkits like Qt and GTK, which support Wayland nowadays. And the toolkits in turn don't really implement the Wayland protocol themselves either. They use support libraries for this purpose. So that's the next point on this list. Wayland provides a, a, a number of support libraries that make it easier to implement the Wayland protocol. And then further down the list, um, the Wayland project also provides a reference implementation of the, of the server side. Like there's a compositor called Weston, which you saw earlier on the map. And I say here a reference compositor, but it's actually used in some product uh, environments nowadays. So they actually um, build something that's good enough to be used in, in a lot of embedded and IVI situations. And then there's some other components, like I mentioned here, XWayland, which is um, a rootless nested X server. So it's basically like XNest, only that it, it runs not underneath X, but underneath Wayland which is uh, something that, that's really necessary to support transit, uh, transitioning uh, an entire distribution over to a new protocol because you cannot really expect all the applications to make the switch at the same time. So if you still want to run an X application on a Wayland desktop, you will transparently get this X server started and things will appear pretty seamless, hopefully. But, um, yeah. Next, next part of this talk is um, I want to talk a little bit about um, the principles that um, are behind the, the Wayland protocol design, just so you get an impression of, of um, why you might want to move off X and, and what the goals were here in def designing this new protocol. So one thing that um, Christian Hertzberg always likes to, likes to say, who is the original um, Wayland architect, 
Um, every frame is perfect. Uh, this frame here, we mean really just um, the refresh of a screen content that, that gets drawn every 60 milliseconds or so. So uh, um, each of those frames should be perfect in the sense that there's no artifacts and no half-drawn content on the screen. And this is just a principle. It doesn't mean that if you're running a Rayland desktop, every frame is actually perfect in practice. What's meant here is that the protocol is designed with this in mind, and in theory, at least, the protocol does not put up obstacles to achieving this goal. And um, to explain that in a, in a little more detail, um, i put down two more bullet points here. Atomic commits, um, that really means that um, we can also say double buffering. So if, if the compositor wants to render a frame, it needs, of course, the new content for the surface that it wants to draw. But it needs a bunch of other things like the, the surface, but also for all the ancillary information that you might need to render it. Uh, and that, of course, um, is driven by this principle that we want the compositor to always have all the information it needs to perfectly render the next frame. It never be in a situation where it maybe only miss, has half the information or half the information is new and half the information is old and it cannot really render a good frame. Um, yeah, and then another principle, I'll talk about that a bit more in a bit, is um, the idea that we want to avoid synchronization when we can, um, just so we don't um, miss frames and uh, things can fl flow nicely. Um, yeah, next principle, I would, um, I've made that up myself, I'm not sure if that's actually something that um, has been put forward as a valid principle, but uh, everything is client-side, more or less. Uh, a few prominent examples for that are fonts, um, are all handled on the client-side. That's nothing new. X has been doing this for like the last decade or more. Any, any server-side fonts are just relics of the past, and there were a few attempts to implement more modern server-side font frameworks like STSF, but all of those have fallen by the wayside, and using font config on the client side is what you're doing under X anyway, so Wayland just continues that. The same goes for rendering. No X application is using the X protocol to render lines or circles or polygons. That's all on client side if you just send a full buffer to the X server. And same, same goes for Wayland. Uh, nested windows or sub-windows, they may be a bit more technical, people might not know about that, but Modern toolkits like GTK actually really only use X windows for their for their top level, like the actual window, and then X allows you to have like small sub windows, like for the for your entries or for your what other controls you put in your inside your window. And um, toolkits don't really use that anymore under X either. Like GTK has for like the last three, four, or five years had uh, something called client side windows, where essentially we regenerate this, this sub-window hierarchy on the client side and, and manage it ourselves. And we really only bother the windowing system for top levels. And when it takes that one step further, it doesn't, like X allows you to create sub-windows, but nobody does it. And in Wayland, uh, you can't really create sub-windows at all. It does have a concept of subsurface, but that's a little different. Um, so let's get that here. The last point is, is maybe the the newest one, and probably still somewhat controversial, under X, traditionally the window decorations, like the colored frame around your top level window, gets drawn by the window manager, so not exactly server side from the window system perspective, but it's not drawn by the client. And Wayland um, kind of encourages applications to do that themselves as well. And um, GTK has been supporting that like for a year now, since last year. And um, yeah, that's still somewhat controversial. There's um, strong opinions on this, and some people just really don't like it. And the okay Kwin developer they said that uh, the window decorations will remain server side on Kwin even on, on, on Wayland. Yeah, um, you can do that on the Wayland as well. Um, on the home side, we we just don't want to. Basically, the protocol is is neutral on that on that matter, more or less. Um, we want to use do the decorations client side because it has some advantages. Like on the last slide, I mentioned that we want to avoid synchronization where we can. And if if only one uh, one uh, application ever draws the content and provides the content for the whole surface, then you don't have to synchronize between 
the application which draws the actual window content and the window manager which draws the frame around it. And that's an extra synchronization which we can avoid by doing it this way. And it also gives the design a lot more freedom to actually make use of the title bar space, which is something our designers appreciate. So, um, as I said, that's still somewhat uh, controversial, but nevertheless, it's, it's there. Um, this is a little more substantial, maybe, not so, not so cosmetic. Um, clients are isolated, uh, which means that um, if you're writing a waiting client, there's no way for you to find out global coordinates. You cannot actually know where your window is placed on the, there's no concept of a root window, so it doesn't even make sense to ask the question. Where's my window positioned on the root window relative to other applications? You just don't get that information. And then there's, there's no grabs, really, which is another X concept that kind of allows you to interfere with other applications by stealing their input. And um, yeah, X uh, was wide open in all these aspects. Every client can basically get everything. On, on his own windows, on other applications' windows, it can get events that are meant for other applications and all that. So, and that's of course useful in some cases. There's, there's very important classes of applications where you need that kind of global access. For instance, if you want to take a screenshot of the whole screen, um, that's not just your windows, so you kind of intentionally want to get the content of other windows. And uh, the valid answer for that is that um, there should be privileged clients for these special purposes, and they can talk to the compositor with a, with a different um, interface or different API, and then get the special access they need. So screenshots and, and screencasts is one example of that. Other examples are um, maybe accessibility, where you really want to have a way to like find out where the mouse pointer is right now, over which application is it currently hovering, that sort of thing and input methods where you, where you have like a dedicated client, like the IPAS server, which really wants to have a special access to all the input that goes by in the compositor and be able to pre-process it in some way. So that, that's where we then would suggest to use privileged clients for these special purposes. And yeah, why is this interesting? It, it's basically, you can summarize this slide by saying, um, way then makes it possible to sandbox applications for the display server perspective, whereas under X it's really basically impossible to do that. There have been some attempts to add the necessary security extensions to X to do it, but it, it's really hard to do this after the fact and retrofit it into an existing system. So all that has basically gotten over, and if you want to do sandboxing with X, the basic answer is, well, you have to use XNest and really run a separate X server for each application. Right, so uh, more principles. Compositing at the core, I made that up myself as well. Um, in X, uh, compositing was added as an afterthought to a non composited windowing system. And um, people quickly recognized that having the window manager, which manages the position of all the windows and, and draws frames around them, and the compositing manager be in separate processes does not really that much make that much sense. It's kind of hard to keep them in sync, and you add a lot of overhead and extra protocol for communicating between the two. So on the X, compositing, compositors nowadays are all compositing window managers, so those two roles have effectively merged. And uh, what Wayland is doing here is basically taking this one step further and saying, um, it does not really make much sense either to have the compositor and the display server be two separate instances or the window manager and the display server v2 separate instances. There's a good chunk of the X protocol that is really just dedicated to enabling, communicating between the window manager and the display server about uh, intercepting client requests and forwarding them to the window manager so it can reject them or modify them. And all this complication goes away if you just say, we we'll put it in one process, then the, these two things can like, talk to each other without needing a public protocol for that and they can share the state inside one process. So that, that makes many things a lot easier. And in particular, it means that you can actually make compositing the, basic, the basis of your display system, and, and everything under Wayland is always composited. 
Right, so this um, gets towards the end of the principles section, so you can see I kind of ran out of ideas here. This is not very impressive as a principle. But way that, the way that protocol is split into multiple interfaces, and um, there's a few examples here. There's one interface, WLC, which describes uh, what under X you would call a display. Basically, you have an output, you have some input, like a keyboard and a mouse, possibly touch support. And all that is bound together as a seat, and there's some operations you can do on them. And then there's, um, there's a few other interfaces. Um, these interfaces can be developed and versioned independently, so there's enough flexibility here to actually um, do new development and experiment with things without destabilizing the core. Uh, the best example of that maybe is the last year, XTG Shell. It's an interface that's meant to encapsulate basically all the operations you need on a typical desktop top-level window, like you can maximize them, um, full screen, things like that. And uh, that's a relatively late addition to this set of interfaces, and it took quite a few iterations to like figure out how we wanted to look. But that did not affect the other interfaces at all; they could remain stable. And it's also kind of optional, like Wayland is often used in uh, non-desktop contexts, for instance in uh, in car entertainment systems, IVI, they often use Weston, but, but their compositors will not implement XTG channel because you really don't want to maximize your speedometer or something like that, so that's not something that's relevant there, so they have their own little interface um, that's suitable to, to their needs. In many ways, this is, uh, I guess, a bit similar to X extensions, and thus it's not really revolutionary. Yeah, moving on. So why would we want to embark on calling from X, which has served as well for like 30 years or so, for something new? But we have to like basically redo a lot of existing uh, things in new ways. Um, I try to come up with a few reasons here and put them on the slide. One reason is that at least the X people will tell you that there's a lot of graph that has accumulated in X over the years, and I tried to mention a few cases earlier where it's actually the case that the core X protocol is largely unused because it has rendering and it has fonts. Nobody uses those. And um, so that's all craft and we have to carry it along as long as we're using X. Do a fresh start with a new protocol allows you to simplify things. Uh, another case where that uh, is relevant is I mentioned earlier that putting the compositor and the display manager into the same process basically with one um, one slew lets you drop all the window manager specific protocol parts, like the parts where, you, where the window manager can, can request that it gets map, map requests sent to himself before they are made effective, things like that. And yeah, so that's, that's on the protocol side. What I mentioned a bit earlier is that uh, sandboxing is a real possibility with Wayland, whereas it's, it's kind of hard to do with X. And um, Wayland will hopefully help us in, in making that actually something that's really secure, so we can we can allow people to run applications that they don't trust, and we can be fairly uh, certain that they don't steal your credit card from some entry in another application. Uh, there's also some possible efficiency gains here. I put the last point on there. Uh, in theory, it's possible to like implement something close to zero copy for buffer contents with Wayland, where you can have the clients basically allocate their buffers in kernel memory and then just pass them on to the compositor and the compositor passes it on to the graphics hardware. Most current compositors don't, don't do that thing, but at least in theory it's possible. Kind of interesting. So, um, yeah, not sure how convincing you find these reasons, but um, that's what fit on the one slide. Of course, there's also some concerns or downsides here, so maybe reasons why you would consider staying with X rather. Um, the first one, um, as I said, in Wayland, the display server and the compositor are just the same process. So if your GNOME shell crashes, that means all your applications lose their connection to the, like the socket connection to the compositor gets closed and then they go away and your session essentially dies. Which is, looks dire in the first place and it's actually a problem if you're doing development on like, the compositor, if you're doing GNOME shell development, like commercially your own. And, um, this is something that affects you probably every day or every other day. But um, I think maybe it's, it's not that big of a concern for regular users. If you compare this to what happens under X, if your window manager crashes, 
all your windows lose their decorations and you cannot move forwards around anymore. So I guess the normal user would be pretty, pretty quick to head to the power, power button and power cycle the system at that point anyway. So in, in reality, it might not be that big of a deal, but it's, it's a concern. And of course, we always strive to keep our compositor from crashing anyway. Um, another concern is um, interoperability. I talked a bit about um, the fact that the Redhead protocol is comprised of these separate interfaces, and different compositors may actually just implement a subset of them. Like They may just not implement the XTG shell interface, and then maybe a Chrome application will not run under some other Redhead desktop, like Hawaii, I believe is the name of one. I think this is something that will um, sort itself out over time. The XTG shell interface is really settling down now, so there was some very active development on that. But, but, but now it's fairly stable, and so I expect that um, we'll, we'll reach uh, stability here where, where most of the important Redhead compositors implement the same interfaces with, uh, with the same version, so we can actually ensure that applications will generally run. But it, it's, um, it's a concern to keep in mind, and uh, it's different from X, where really everybody's using the same X server, and, and they run a different window manager maybe, but the X server at least always speaks the same X protocol. Um, so, um, yeah. Last point is driver support. Um, so currently the NVIDIA driver does not support Wayland, and uh, we're talking to them about um, having them add suitable APIs that we can use to implement Wayland on top of the proprietary driver. Right now that's not in place. But um, Nouveau works fine. So this is something that I expect will, will fix itself over time. Right. So moving on, um, I have a brief section here about history. I'll try to keep that short. Um, this is really prehistory, this slide. I'm not sure if, how many of you can think back to the early 90s, but there was actually attempts to like replace X or do something better than X early on. Fresco was a project that the X consortium did like in the early 90s, 93 or so. And uh, later on, when the X consortium ceased to exist, it was renamed first to Berlin and then to Warsaw, Warsaw, I believe. I'm not sure that's still around, but there was an attempt to do a, a better interface. And in some, some ways, it's a precursor, I think, to what Bayern is doing now. GGI, the General Graphics Interface, also a project that was, was started in the early 90s. There was an attempt to get uh, graphics support into the Linux kernel. Um, that was probably too early before its time. It didn't have much success. The project is still around. I believe it's focusing on other kernels now, other than Linux. And then there's some others like DirectFB, which was an attempt to get some frame buffer device into the kernel that um, supports better graphics. And a lot of these had some, some level of success in their time, but none of them came close to replacing X or be a successor to X in the way that I think Wayland is nowadays. And switching from prehistory to more modern history. So um, the story of Wayland really begins, I think, in 2008, um, when kernel mode setting was introduced. I said earlier the, the GGI project was an attempt to get graphics into the kernel. And in 2008, um, we tried that again and realized that what you really need in the kernel is mainly the mode setting part of the of the X drivers. And that's what we nowadays call KMS. I actually looked back there. There was a app for our 10 feature called kernel mode setting uh, back when we when this work was started. The original motivation for this was, I believe, largely driven by having a better boot experience. We wanted to uh, minimize the number of mode switches between uh, your boot load and your desktop. Um, Dreamers have also started around that time as a component of that whole better boot work. And yeah, in the same year, <coughs> Wayland was started by Christian while he was still at Red Hat. I vaguely remember seeing like the famous rotating flowers demo over his cube ball back in 2008 or 2009. I also remember discussing client side decorations with him back in those early days. I was not convinced at all at that time. Um, so sometimes these things need some time. And I think now that's, that's the right thing to do. But back then, I was not convinced. Um, well, didn't want to know. Um, yeah, um, 
moving down this slide, GTK got an initial Radiant backend in 2010, and things continued to move at a fairly slow pace. And around the end of 2012, when Christian declared Radiant to be 1.0, that's when things really started picking up, and we decided that we had to look at porting home to Wayland in early 2013. I remember we had a uh, preparation meeting in, uh, in Christian's kitchen when he was still living in Cambridge. That was in March 2013, where I had to pick up Jasper and drive out to Cambridge, which is normally like a 30-minute ride from where I live, but it took us more than two hours because it was a terrible snow day. But I was very productive, and um, in the fall of 2013, we released uh, GNOME 310 with what we call experimental valence support. And then another cycle on this spring, we released 3.12, which has a lot more complete support. And it also starts using the XDG shell interface now. And basically, that's where we are now. We're in the middle of yet another cycle. And what we're aiming for in Fedora 21 is to have basically the Wayland session be day-to-day -day usable. There will still be some gaps. I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so, yeah, I'll switch back one more to a little more technical details. I wanted to explain briefly how the Wayland product form actually looks, what, what the involved components are here, and, and what, we, what we've done. So I, I mentioned on that history slide, GTK has a has a Wayland backend, and GNOME Shell or Matter or our are our Wayland compositor. Um, for input, it is using new input, which is um, shared with Western and other Wayland compositors. It's actually uh, a new library that tries to extract a lot of the low-level input handling functionality out of X drivers and make it available, so Wayland compositors can use it. If you want to know more about that, you probably want to go to Hans's talk after lunch, where he talks in depth about input and Wayland. And um, yeah, a lot of functionality that used to sit in GNOME settings demon. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the in internals of, of how a GNOME session looks, but there's the compositor window manager, GNOME shell, that's running as the one big process, and then there's GNOME settings demon, which is a, a demon process without user interface, which handles a lot of um, settings changes and applies settings to your um, X display and so on. And a lot of that functionality that used to be in GNOME Statics Daemon is now moving directly into GNOME Shell. Um, examples of that are display configuration, keyboard configuration, color calibration, all that works now. Basically, GNOME Shell directly reads the settings and applies them. Wouldn't really make much sense to like, have another detour through another process for that. And in some cases, um, GNOME Shell actually exposes DBus APIs where uh, for instance, the control center can get information about your dis displays, so it can present them in the display panel. That's that's a new DBus interface that we added. And then um, there's another DBus interface for taking screenshots and screencasts, which I mentioned earlier as an example of like a privileged client that needs a, a special interface. In this case, we chose to use a DBus interface, mainly, I guess, because we already had that interface before we started porting to Wayland. And yeah, looking a bit at the technical status of how mature all this is, as I said down at the bottom of the slide, our end goal is to have the Wayland session be day-to-day -day usable in Fedora 21, which I guess you can parse that either way, but day-to-day -day usable does not necessarily mean that that will be fully complete, so there's going to be a few gaps that I list above there. On the GTK side, I mean, the backend itself is, is really stable. I haven't seen any crashes on applications just because they're running under Wayland. But drag and drop is currently not supported. That's, that's largely because the internal API that GTK has for drag and drop does not really match the Wayland API very well, and it's kind of involved in, in moving things around to, um, to make it work somehow. That'll take a little more time. And then the... Um, on the control center side, input configuration, um, I think we will not have that working in F21. But input itself is working pretty well. I, uh, input has made great strides recently. Like one, of the, one of the early problems when you were logging into Wayland like for the last year or so was that um, you didn't have input acceleration. So if you move your mouse, you kind of feel that you have to push it down. And it moves very slow, <laughs> which is a very obvious thing that kind of 
after five minutes, you give up and go back to X where the mouse actually moves. And so that's in place now. The input provides input acceleration. We cannot configure it yet, but that will come. And another thing I believe that recently landed in the input is um, palm detection. So if you, like me, tend to have your, your thumbs on the touchpad, that should work a lot better now. Um, yeah. Wacom support, I talked to Hans about this over, over breakfast this morning, is actively being worked on and will appear in uh, lib input, I believe, probably about the time for F21, but soon thereafter. And yeah, that's the current status. And first you can ask, why does all this take so long? I kind of uh, outlined that we started the porting early 2013 and now it's mid-2014, so we take our dear time in getting there. And I guess some reasons for that is that we kind of have a well-working and polished desktop under X now with Chrome 312, and we don't really want to risk that or give people a bad experience because the right way to think about the Wayland port is that if we do our job really well at the end of it, then users will not actually notice that they're using Wayland and not X anymore. There will be no obvious signs. So, and, and if you do this kind of invisible change, it would be a little rough to like take on more big regressions because we want to get there early. And rather we want to avoid regressions and take our time and, and not make this the default before the port is actually complete. Yeah, another reason is features. While we're doing this valid porting work, actually we're working on features at the same time, like a lot of things like the high DPI support, better touch support, pervasive animations, all that is being developed in parallel to, to this work. So um, that, of course, slows things down. Yeah. And X, X had 30 years to establish itself as our de facto standard display server, um, which in itself does not necessarily mean that much, but a lot of, for instance, the, the GTK APIs are more or less directly modeled along X, which means it's, it's a little harder to make them work under Wayland sometimes. And, we may want to replace them with uh, APIs that are more neutral or maybe modeled along valent concepts, and that, again, takes more time. The last point is that we actually want to keep the X code paths working until we're ready to switch over to Wayland as the default, and maybe not even now, which um, is always a little harder if you have to like, keep two code paths working and insert and um, just by very often asked, like, can we not just drop all this X code and start over from scratch, essentially? Which would have gotten us to like a Wayland desktop, I guess, a lot quicker, but the world would have been a lot rougher. So we chose not to do that, and we will keep the X code working, but that means that we have to like, do a lot more internal refactoring inside Potter um, to, yeah, to make things work nicely in parallel. And that's it. Um, that's my update on Wayland. Uh, if you have any questions, now would be a good time. Are you thinking about introducing some signals when, for example, in Anaconda, we have a problem that we start the X server and then the window manager, but we have no idea when it is actually initialized and we when we can start like GUI stuff. Okay. So that is a big problem that I think Wayland could solve quite easily. Right. So um, I think that problem will not exist under Wayland per se because uh, in Wayland the compositor itself is the desktop shell. So as, as soon as you have a connection to your compositor, you can basically assume that the desktop is operational and you're good to go. We can actually, we do have a signal under X, actually, if you, if you want to know about it. There's a window manager change signal somewhere inside GDK that you can listen for. That's on GDK screen, I believe. I think you should get that in that situation, so that might be a, a way to go. Well, you can initialize GDK if the X server is not initialized. Right, yeah, it might not be. We need, to, we need to know when we can initialize GDK and GDK. Right. Yeah, I, we have to look at that in detail, I guess. But in principle, there's a signal already. Uh, I would like
like uh, I would like to ask uh, what are the current plans for network transparency or at least like screen scraping support or something in the toolkits? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think there's um, like Western has a concept of backends and there's a, an RDP backend for instance for Western. I think something like that would be possible in GNOME Shell as well. Um, so that, that's I guess the, the level of thinking that we currently have. And you can of course always use some, some dedicated separate protocol for that. Okay. Hi. Um, I just had an easy question. Is suspend known to be an issue with Western right now, or would that uh, Wayland, or would that just be a bug on my system? It's not known to me. Um, okay. Probably just a bug. Probably just a bug. Yeah. Yeah. All right. There's no further questions. Uh, once again, there's one more. So uh, the media, at least, has made a big deal about the uh, Wayland versus um, Mir uh, divergence. Has there been any effort whatsoever to bring them back into the fold, considering that just about everybody else has gone Wayland? Has there been any effort to try and pull those developers back in, um, take some of their better ideas and actually make Wayland better? I haven't done any backroom deals or any uh, things of that sort. <laughs> um, I don't know what, what, what they are going to do with, with Mirror long term. We'll have to just wait and see. There is a, a GTK backend for Mirror that they have pushed in a branch. Uh, I asked them at Quadec if they were interested in merging that. Uh, maybe next cycle. So um, I don't know. We'll have to see. Wait and see what happens there. At the end of the day, the Mirror backend is very similar to the Wayland backend. It's basically the same code. So it doesn't seem worth having two entirely separate systems there. But um, we don't control that. All right. Just a simple question. But, um, does GNOME Wayland work with uh, KVM? Um, so um, I think KVM can. Um, sorry, KVM. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, actually, you can, if you go into we have this continuous. Um, build system, integration system called uh, build.nom.org. If you go there, we'll, uh, we show you what we call smoke tests, which is basically we build the latest the tip of master, of master everything, and then we uh, compose a VM out of it, and we, we launch that, and we take a screenshot of the login screen to verify that things work. And we do that not just for like, GNOME under X, but also for classic mode and for GNOME under Wayland. And until recently, it actually it worked. It broke over the weekend. Uh, I have to track down what's going on there. But it works, yeah. That that uh, was waiting for a long time for landing some MISA patches that needed were needed for that. But but those are master now. All right. Thanks everybody. Any questions?